If one could actually hear the sound of a nation being born, that would sound would probably sound an awful lot like the dream of the rude, which comes from the early, early, early days of uh, of Great Britain. the uh, The actual age of it is a little uncertain. It comes in that vague period of uh, uh, of the Christianizing of England, roughly. After the uh, after the Romans pulled out, and after uh, and before uh, before 1066, before the uh, the Battle of Hastings, uh, you get in that period a great deal of flux, a great deal of social upheaval, a great deal of uh, religious anarchy. In a way, you get influences from the uh, um, indigenous Druid and Celtic population. You get um, uh, you get the influx of Anglo-Saxons. You get residual Roman influence. There's all of this uh, churning around and trying to sort itself out. And out of that fermentation, you get uh, some pretty extraordinary works of art. Beowulf is the uh, the the big one uh, of this, but at roughly the same period, somewhere around the same time, you get the Dream of the Rude, which is found really on just a single manuscript that is dated to the early, uh, or l I think the early 10th century, maybe late 10th century. Uh, but it had almost certainly come from, you know, that's just when they happen to have a copy of it. Uh, it had certainly come from quite a while before. The, most scholars tend to pin it somewhere uh, around the uh, 7th or 8th century. Parts of it very likely uh, oral to begin with, um, uh, chunks of it perhaps rewritten, some parts that some people say that there are parts missing. Uh, it's, it's all a little bit of a mystery. But what we have in the Dream of the Root is really an extraordinary document, uh, not only of, uh, 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 of great poetic art, but of, I would say, this, uh, this organizing principle going on, this dynamic um, uh, shaping up of what would become the character of Great Britain. Um, so it begins as all poems, and frankly, every utterance should begin, with the, uh, with the old English word, what? <laughs> which I love. And it's the, same, it's the same first word that begins Beowulf. Most scholars agree it's, uh, um, it is simply a way of getting attention. Uh, you can imagine largely that uh, a lot of poetry, especially poetry that coming out of an oral tradition, was perhaps performed in a public forum. And so belting out what at the beginning is a way of saying, excuse me, I would like to speak now. And it's just a little bit more aggressive. But you can see in that a kind of declarative force um, uh, here I like to think of it as kind of their, their Germanic roots kicking in the, uh, the Anglos, the Saxons, the, uh, the little Viking influence and stuff where it is a very aggressive way of starting something. It's very affirmative. It's very sharp. So what, which most translators today will, uh, translate as, uh, you know, listen as we have from, uh, Liuzzi. The, uh, the translator here, uh, Seamus Heaney's Beowulf does it as so, and you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, but listen, or you know, uh, you know, hey, yo, any of those little expostulations that grab attention. So, listen, I will speak of a sweetest dream what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Which is an interesting little uh, way to start. It's um, uh, getting past what or listen. Uh, you say, speak of the sweetest dream. This is a dream vision poem. This is a, uh, a work out of the, uh, the ecstatic tradition of religious prophecy where 
uh, primarily uh, in the early days of Christianity, uh, the uh, the monks, uh, ascetic monks, would go out into the desert and uh, suffer physical torment and and mortification of the flesh. They wouldn't eat. They'd sit in the sun. It would be uncomfortable. Uh, and all to attain a kind of higher spiritual uh, uh, awareness. Um, and this is significant because Britain was at this point uh, in this period of history, uh, the tradition of Christianity was largely being carried on in monasteries. The once the Romans pulled out a lot of the uh, the official public church stuff uh, was coming under some attack and pressure, and you know the the Celts and and the natives were saying, "Okay, enough of you guys." Uh, but in the monasteries, you get uh, you get a little continuity, a little continuum where they're, uh, they are working with documents, they are um, uh, contributing to scholarship, uh, but they are also of this particular mindset that comes out of a kind of ecstatic tradition of deep physical uh, punishment uh, as the avenue towards spiritual enlightenment. Uh, also uh, significant that this uh, that phrase speech bearers slept in their rest. This comes in the middle of the night when quote speech bearers slept in their rest. Speech bearers is kind of awkward, uh, but you know, no more than most old English stuff. Uh, and here we can read it as humans, but also significantly what distinguishes a human while well, their ability to speak. And what are they not doing when they are resting? They are not speaking. So this dream comes to the dreamer when, at a time when uh, everybody else is just not doing perhaps what they should be doing, what they were designed to do. They were designed to speak, but they're not. It seemed to me that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, circled round with light, the brightest of beams, all that beacon was covered in gold, gems stood fair as the earth's corners, and five there were up on the crossbeam. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity, that was no felon's gallows, but holy spirits beheld him there, men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Beacon, a beacon is a signal. A beacon is a sign. A beacon is something that sends out a, uh, a uh, an image that can be interpreted and perhaps as a warning or as an invitation. Uh, that's uh, that's sig that's significant. Um, and and the idea that uh, he saw this wondrous tree, a tree. We'll we'll get there. Um, it's a, uh, it's, it's no felon's gallows. He's seeing is like, well, no, that's, that's not a, a, uh, a, an implement of punishment that is something quite holy. So in his, uh, religious spiritual, uh, um, vision, he is seeing that, okay, it is much more than something that can be used to exact punishment. Wondrous was the victory tree, and I was fouled by sins. Wounded with guilt, I saw the tree of glory, honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient wretched struggle, for it first began to bleed on the right side. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for all that fair vision. I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now bedecked with treasure. That's a, uh, that's a mouthful. But you can see in this, this image of the tree, and he is contrasting that with his own wretched state. He feels quite wretched. He feels uh, uh, wounded with guilt. He is fouled by sins. Uh, he, he is feeling bad about himself. Perhaps as a 
member of the speech bearers who are all at their rest and not practicing the, uh, the art of speech, this is part of it. It's not certain at this point, but he saw the tree of glory. Glory is very important. Uh, this is an image of great uh, glory. And what is glory? Glory. Glory um, is going to come in for a lot of different definitions, but think in terms of the, uh, well, glory is being hailed by your fellow man. Glory is being celebrated. Glory is often a military or martial quality or value. People go to war to seek glory very often. And it is a warrior ethos that seeks glory. Um, honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold, gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. Uh, perhaps part is the part of the dream vision is he is seeing all of these gems all of this sparkling glory perhaps he is seeing it within the image rather than on the surface of the image itself because she, he says uh and yet beneath that gold i began to see an ancient wretched struggle so he's leading the tree he is leaning in and saying I see something beneath it. I can interpret it. I can look into an object and see more than is visible to the naked eye. Um, even though it is now drenched with blood, now bedecked with treasure, blood and treasure. Those are two separate uh, uh, values, I would say, two separate um, appeals that it's making, but they're in parallel. There's one and then there's the other. And parallelism is very important in this poem because one thing is set by the other and we're meant to understand a kind of relationship between the two, often a, a great similarity. And the blood is a kind of treasure in this, uh, in this calculation. And yet lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree until I heard it utter a sound that bare, that, be that best of woods began to speak words. It was so long ago, I remember it still, and I, that I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Strong enemies seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders and then set me on a hill. Enemies, though enough, enemies enough, fixed me fast. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend onto me. I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree. The Savior is Jesus Christ. The, uh, the, the dawning perception is starting to click in here where he, uh, he sees that this tree has become animate. This tree is now speaking to him directly. The tree, uh, and here we can see a Celtic. Uh, uh, influence. The tree is a, uh, the speaking tree is an example of Celtic animism where uh, normally inanimate objects have, suddenly have souls and consciousness. And uh, it is suddenly speaking directly to the dreamer. It was so long ago I remember it still. So again, referencing the distant, distant past. Uh, for them, uh, arguably, uh, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years, roughly, from the crucifixion is what we're talking about here. Um, but also the the image of Christ that it uh, that it casts. Um, strong enemies seize me. Who are the enemies? Well, who uh, who is in charge of crucifying Christ? The Romans. Who were the interlopers in Britain? for so many years who had just been, you know, finally kicked out, uh, well, not kicked out, withdrawn, uh, but who, uh, who would be the, uh, consider the interlopers from, uh, by the from the perspective of the natives, the, uh, of the Celtics, of the Anglo-Saxons, they would view the Romans 
as enemies. So here the poem is, or at least the cross here, is siding with the ordinary people against the Romans, identifying them. They are the enemies. Because when they say that, yeah, everybody around us said, well, yeah, the Romans are the enemies. We've been, you know, fighting them for however long. Um, and uh, so strong age uh, seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. Again, that sense of uh, subjection, uh, that sense of, uh, of almost, you know, imperialism, quite frankly. They're, they feel like they have been uh, this totalitarian force forcing them to do things. Um, then I saw the Lord of Mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend onto me. That's Christ. And here, he's not going to it regretfully. He's not going to it meekly. Um, he is not going to it uh, even, you know, uh, in, in any sort of agony or, uh, or discomfort at all. He is going eagerly. He hastens upon the cross like he's charging into battle. This is not uh, a weak Jesus Christ. This is a warrior Jesus Christ. This is an image of a warrior God, one that would appeal to, let's say, the Germanic Anglo-Saxons, who by nature are very aggressive, very warlike, and have warrior values and uh, warrior ethics. So the meek Christ image isn't necessarily going to appeal to them, but a strong-armed warrior, aggressive, forward-leaning Christ, that's something they can get on board with. He wanted to ascend onto me. Uh, he's, uh, he is charging up there. There I dared not bow down or break against the Lord's word when I, made, when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, and yet I stood fast. The cross sees it as a duty to be the instrument of death. Christ seems to see it in this as his duty to be the sacrifice. Neither one is shirking from that duty. They are doing their jobs as they understand them. They're not going to try and stall. They're not going to try and evade. They're going to it very, again, very aggressively, very uh, uh, obediently to the moment. It's not even, they're not even necessarily being told that they have to do these things, but they're being told that, um, or, well, they're not being told, but they understand that this is my duty. This is my function. This is what I have to do. And so they're both doing it in the most full-throated way that they can, uh, that they can muster. Then the young hero made ready. That was God Almighty, strong and resolute. He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom ma mankind. Well, young hero, a hero is a warrior, um, but also, remember the parallelism, uh, young hero, uh, that was God. He's the hero, he's the warrior, and he's also God. That parallelism that is an equal but distinct um, capacity of, uh, of, the, of, of the, the image within the poem. Uh, but also looking down, you know, he wanted to ransom mankind. Think about that word also, ransom. That's a, that's a bizarre world, word there. Um, the concept of it is, I mean, where, where, where is ransom coming from? Ransom is a, another uh, martial quality. Uh, think, of, uh, think of Viking wergelt, wergelt rather, uh, where somebody does something wrong, you have to pay your way or pay that person's way out of it. If somebody from your tribe does something wrong to another tribe, uh, you have to pay that other tribe in order to even the stakes. I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. Embraced is... Uh, 
Some critics have noted the somewhat sexualized language uh, with this, where he is coming up to embrace the uh, the cross, uh, and the cross has to receive the embrace. Uh, I, I'm not sure what's going on there. I, I can see it sort of, you know, pulsing very slightly underneath the surface here. Maybe it's a thing. I, I, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's possible. They drove dark nails through me. The scars are still visible, open wounds of hate. I dared not harm any of them. They mocked us both together. I was all drenched with blood flowing from the man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered its had, darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse. That shining radiance, shadows spread gray under the clouds. All creation wept, mourning the king's fall. Christ on the cross. A lot going on there. Think in terms here of, uh, well, you know, what is really going on here? Who is the star of this poem, so to speak? Who is the, uh, who is the main player in this uh, little scene? Um, Christ is coming off as more of a supporting character, quite frankly. Um, the nails go through the cross. They don't mention that they went through his, his body to get into the cross. The cross presented only as, no, the nails punctured me. Um, interesting little conclusion there. Uh, Who is more important? Uh, that will become significant. Uh, and, and also the, uh, the death of Christ, which you would figure is sort of the, uh, the momentous moment here is really kind of an afterthought. Uh, the camera isn't necessarily giving him his close up in that moment. Uh, you, you read, you read it together. You know, they, they mocked us together. I was all drenched with blood. Well, you know, it's Christ's blood. It's not his, uh, or it's not the cross's blood. I was all drenched with blood flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Sent forth his spirit means he died. His spirit left his body. And so uh, this happens after that, that he's mentioning. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, he died, yada, yada, yada. But now I am feeling all the blood. Um who is the star here? Who is the more important figure? Uh, this is a kind of transference from the man, Christ, to the symbol, the cross. It's a, uh, a, a bizarre little uh, shift, a kind of a shell game almost. Um, and note also the parallelism at the end, Christ on the cross. Christ here is kind of equivalent to or equal to the cross. How do you distinguish between them? Are they the same? Um, it, it's, it, there's a lot of tension going on in that little uh, uh, verbal construction of having the two. And yet from afar, men came hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. I was all beset with sorrows, yet I sank into their hands humbly, eagerly. There they took almighty God, lifted him from my heavy torment, from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me, standing drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. They laid him down, bone weary, and stood by his body's head. They watched the Lord of heaven there who rested a while, weary from his mighty battle. They began to build a tomb for him. In the sight of his slayer, they carved it from bright stone and set within the Lord of victories. They began to sing a dirge for him, wretched at evening. Then they, then they wished to travel hence, weary from the glorious land. He rested there with little company. First of all, his body's head, he is no longer part of his body. So again, you get a little bit of a mind, body, spirit, body, uh, dualism. Warriors did this though. Warriors took him down. Not, you know, not followers, not apostles. Well, the apostles weren't really there at this point, but not followers. Warriors. Important 
terminology here. Who are they appealing to? They are appealing to war warriors. They're trying to sell Christianity to warriors. Um, and and that little uh, little service they give him, they they surround him and sing a dirge. That's 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 a warrior's funeral. That is a uh, that is a ancient barbarian Germanic warrior's funeral. Uh, it is not a it is not a necessarily Christian thing, but they are appropriating it and they are using it to recast the story of the crucifixion in particularly Germanic warrior terms. And as we stood there weeping a long while fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors, the corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to fell us all to the earth, a terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's thanes, friends, found me there, adorned me with gold and silver. Now you can hear my dear hero. Who's a hero? The dreamer. Think about that. Who wants to be a hero? Warriors. That I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me. Men over the earth and all this glorious creation. And pray to this sign on me. The, Lord, the Son of God suffered for a time. And so, glorious now, I rise up under the heavens and am able to heal each one of those who is in awe of me. Once I made into the worst once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. Notice the repetition suddenly, that comes back. Lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he had also, almighty God, honored his mother, Mary herself, above all womankind, for the sake of men. Now I bid you, my beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men. Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his, with his great might to help mankind. He ascended into heaven. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. Almighty God, the Lord himself and his angels with him, and he will judge. He has the power of judgment. Each one of them as as they have earned beforehand here in this loaned life. No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be, who might for the Lord's name would taste bitter death as he did earlier on that tree. But they will tremble then and little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But no one there need be very afraid who has borne in his breast the best of beacons and through the cross shall seek the kingdom every soul from this earthly way, whoever thinks to, the, to rest with the ruler. Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart eagerly there where I was alone with little company. My spirit longed to start the journey forth. It has felt so much of longing it is now my life's hope that i may stick to seek the tree of victory alone more than other men and honor it well i wish for that with all my heart and my hope of protection is fixed on the cross i have few wealthy friends on earth and all have gone forth fled from worldly joys sought the king of glory they live now in heaven with the high father and dwell in glory each day. And I look forward to that time when the cross of the Lord on which I have looked while here on this earth will fetch me from this lone life and bring me where there is great bliss, joy in heaven, where the Lord's host is seated at the feast with ceaseless bliss. And then set me where I may afterwards dwell in glory, share joy fully with the saints. May the Lord be my friend, he who here on earth once suffered on the hanging trees, on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us and gave us life in heavenly home. 
Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. The sun was successful in that journey, mighty and victorious, when he came with a multitude, a great host of souls into God's kingdom, the one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing, and all the saints already in heaven dwelling in glory, when almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful home. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something. The, uh, the... The poetic qualities are, are pretty evident. The, uh, the, the alliteration is part of the alliterative revival, same as with Beowulf. It's a little less obvious in this translation. Um, the repetition, the, the repeating of phrases and of sounds, um, that, that, that recurrence of loaned life, loaned mean, uh, is, is doctrine and is Christian do doctrine, which says that, uh, this life is not yours. You are merely occupying it at the discretion of the creator. Uh, it's a, it's a sense of, uh, the impermanence of life but also of the vulnerability of it and the, uh, the, the natural weakness of it, which would perhaps inspire a warrior type to be more willing to shed it to get on to the greater strength. Uh, the, um, you see the, uh, uh, the linking of, uh, of, of a lot of different ideas, again, more parallelism, uh, Almighty God had suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Almighty God, Jesus suffering for mankind's many sins, that's Jesus. For Adam's uh, many sins, that's Adam. So linking the, uh, the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible together and reminding everybody that, okay, this, this is not coming up out of nowhere. This has a long tradition. This has been around for a while. You cannot just dispel this. Um, and and that the, that powerful uh, um, uh, that powerful image towards the uh, towards the end where uh, the the dreamer says or the the final uh, the final uh, words of the tree rather of the cross says. Uh, um, uh, who uh, who for the Lord's name would suffer bitter death as he did earlier on that tree, but they will tremble then and little think what they might even uh, begin to say to Christ. It's when Christ comes back um, on, uh, on in Revelations, the day of judgment, uh, really, uh, you know, a, a, a fear-inducing uh, prospect for sinners. But notice also what allays that fear no one need no one there need be very afraid who has borne in his breast the best of beacons but through the cross shall seek the kingdom uh born on his breast he's he's talking about uh perhaps wearing a cross which is on the breast uh or at least in the breast a kind of symbolic cross but here, this is, this is, I think, the, the core point of the poem. It is, uh, they're not talking about bearing in your heart, you know, the uh, bearing in your heart the spirit of Christ or the teaching of Christ even, but rather the image of the cross, the symbol, not the thing, the symbol. It's substituting the thing. Thing, the object for its symbol, which I find rather curious because, um, well, why? The, uh, the first word, the first line of the dreamer after the cross stops talking, you have this wonderful polyphony of speaking voices throughout the poem. But after the cross stops talking, you get the uh, the first line of the of, of this dreamer who says, "Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart." He didn't pray to God; he prayed to the tree. He prayed to the symbol, the cross. He's praying to the institution. 
institution more than the spirit. The institution that is visible to mankind and its representative of the spirit, perhaps, but still praying to the tree. And here in the poem, it's not even saying praying to the cross, but rather the tree, which represents the cross, which represents Christ, which represents whatever. So he is really, really drilling down on this sense of abstraction, on this sense of uh, uh, the, the, the physical manifestation that we can see, that is part of us. Now, again, still tree, uh, it's, looping in some of the uh, the Celtic tradition here. The warrior stuff is obviously all very much aimed at the uh, at the Germanic Anglo-Saxons um, and any Vikings that might be knocking through town. Uh, but that that appeal is very much to bring them all together in the act of uh, unity before the institution of the church, not so much the spirit of it, but the institution of it. The cross, not Christ. It makes sense, quite frankly, from a sociological standpoint, where the church is trying to organize some very disparate people with some fairly difficult beliefs uh, or incongruous beliefs. This poem lays out in its, uh, it is talking about the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, uh, almighty God honored his mother, Mary herself. Um, he, he's clicking off all of this doctrine, all of the, the liturgy of Christianity that people are going to need to know. But he's saying, okay, now, but everybody direct your attention to the symbol, to the sign, not so much Christ himself. It's, it, it, it's a curious displacement. It's a curious um, dislocation of spirituality into a physical and recognizable thing. Remember, um, Christianity can be a little abstract sometimes, and people are going to have a hard time with that. But if you give uh, a, a more barbaric people, let's say, if you give uh, people who are used to uh, material, uh, mat who are more materialistic in general, who, who, who want to see something solid before them, before they can believe in anything, by doing that, they're helping open up Christianity to those people and at the same time tell them that they need to uh, get behind this institution. They need to respect and honor and pray to this thing, this cross, as an institution. And so we can start to run this thing called Great Britain. The appeal is very much to those warrior values, to those barbaric tribes, if you will. Um, even then, you know, I, uh, I crack up a little bit when I see, you know, uh, it is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of victory alone more than all other men, or uh, which is competition. <laughs> you know? I want to be the best, which is, you know, guys, what are you going to do? Uh, but... Uh, the order, the marching order at the end of this is to go and proselytize, go and evangelize, go and convert. The dreamer who was part of the uh, resting sleep bearers at the beginning is now charged, uh, having been bid to uh, reveal this vision to men, tell them in words that is that it is the tree of glory on which their almighty God suffered. He has been converted to a speaker. He has been converted to a evangelist to go out and sell this language, perhaps even this very poem, to ordinary people, to the people in the countryside, to bring them to Christianity, 
to the church, to the organizing principle of this new society trying to take root. This is the birth of Britain right here. The, um, the image that the end of, uh, of, uh, of heaven itself, it's not a peaceful, placid uh, image. It's a feast. It's not angels and seraphs and harps and clouds. It sounds more like a, uh, like a raucous beer hall where there's endless food, endless drink, all of the pleasures that a warrior values, a physicalized pleasure almost. Because that's the language Christianity needs to speak in these early days in order to get anyone to follow along.